Well, hello there and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Sandy Alnock and today's project is an Inktober piece, a kitten walking down a path in a forest. And this was a crazy epic thing. It took me days and days and days of work on it. But I'm doing this specifically for the people who watched this video, especially in the last month or so, when a lot of you signed up to subscribe to this channel, because look at how many views this one suddenly got. There's just an uptick. Maybe it's because people were prepping for Inktober, could be. Could just be that YouTube got a wild hair and decided to share it. But either way, I am happy to have all of you here with me. And in that video, you can see me working through this chart. You can download the chart for free. There's a link in the doobly-doo so that you can go pick it up yourself. And there, it comes with a blank practice sheet so you can fill one in yourself and practice those textures. In that video, the project that I created once I got done with the chart was a Christmas card. And it was a very simple Christmas card anybody can do. It's just using one of the patterns to create negative shapes for Christmas trees. But today I want to show you how you can do these kind of textures to make something much more advanced. So let's get started with that. My day one sketch for Inktober is this raccoon and it inspired the project that I'm working on for you today, the kitten. And what I found in this was I was using my Eco Twisby extra fine nib and on this paper, I started getting lighter tones and not because I was leaving extra space in between them. Well, I did some of that, but also because the pressure is able to change when you're on a paper that's a little bit on the bumpy side. Now, traditionally, I like to use a nice smooth Hanamula paper because it gives me a nice consistent flat line that is the same weight. And I normally don't like it when it changes, but when I was trying to do something soft and realistic, that worked wonderfully. So I got out this mitantis, me mitantis. Me oh my gosh, somebody help me pronounce this word. This paper, and it's in a green color. I'll apologize for the shifts in color because every time the camera pointed to it, it had some issues. But it's a colored paper and has just a slight, slight texture to it. And you'll want to try things out on different papers that you have if you want to get this effect. But basically, the whole idea is to let the paper and the pen work together to create some of those lighter tones. The cat is not gonna have very much in terms of lighter tones, except for leaving that airspace in between the lines. So I'm using some pressure to draw in the lines so that I don't get anything that's soft and gray because I'm gonna need a lot more of that for everything else and I want the cat to remain the focus. So for, for this, I'm using different kinds of linear textures, different kinds of stippling, and I'm going to draw in specifically all of the kitty's hair, just line by line and putting lines closer to each other or overlapping each other when it gets dark and further apart from each other when it gets light. But I'm not using lighter pressure at this point, just so that I keep the richness of those lines nice and dark. And then when I get to the rest of it, I'll be able to do a little bit more subtle looks with the pen and ink. One of the things to pay attention to here is when you're drawing something like a cat that has a very soft outer edge to it, it's got all that fur that doesn't have a sharp line around it. A lot of people are tempted to just draw the outline of the head, draw the ears, draw the body, but I only drew them in pencil. And then as I got to each of those outlines, I drew hash marks for the hair that goes around them or dotted lines if I had to do something and there there wasn't like a, a thick line of fur around it. But generally I'm trying to take the negative shape, which I talked about in that previous video that lots of you watched, take the negative shape and make the lighter shape in front of it by drawing the negative shape behind it. And that's one of the things that if you can learn how to think in reverse and you're drawing the background instead of the object, then the object can be white or in this case green on green paper. But you can get those kind of value differences if what you're drawing is the dark parts behind it. 
And I did that for all of the little hairs, all the little marks on the cat, as well as all the way around that outside edge. There is a little bit of a, a line around parts of the ears, but I'm going to handle that when I get to the background because the background I can butt right up against that line and that's going to create a nice sharp edge for the ears when we get to that point. But I'm going to leave it right as it is for now and just worry about getting the interior parts of the kitten done. The ink that I'm using is Carbon Black by Platinum. And in my mind, it is the one water resistant ink that, that everybody should have. It's just one of the best inks there is. And the Eco Twisby, even though it's a fairly inexpensive pen, is my recommendation for anybody who's going to start in pen and ink because it's a wonderful pen. It doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. It comes in three different widths. This one is the extra fine. And depending on what paper you're using, this pen can have a heavier line or it can have a lighter line. But, you know, a paper like this that's drawing paper is going to have a little bit less of a a line just because the ink is floating across the top of the paper. So I get a thinner line on this, thicker line on a smoother paper. So when it got to the leaves, I wanted a fully different texture than the cat because leaves and a cat are completely different. So the kitten has all the lines that look like fur. Here I'm using stippling and I was about driving myself bananas with this, but it it was looking so good that I kept going with the stippling. There's a few areas where the stippling gets really dark. And in that section, I would put scribbling and then just blend the scribbling slowly with more stippling so that the stippling would carry then into the lighter areas. But the darker areas, I didn't have to do dot, dot, dot in those. I just would scribble a solid color in there. So each one of these different sections has different amounts of scribbling going on in it. And here, even when I have an outline around something like a leaf, I would start with just a corner of it and I would make a shadow on one side or the other of the leaf. Now, if you make a line and then your dark area is on the outside of the leaf, that's negative drawing. If your shadow is on the inside of the leaf, then that's positive shading on that leaf itself. But I don't leave my lines just kind of showing out there for all to see. I try to hide them by making them implied lines. Implied lines are lines that the eye sees because when you look at an object and it's next to another object, if there are different values, if one is darker than the other, then you kind of see a line. You see the border between the two shapes, but you don't see a line. You don't, you don't see like everything in your life is not outlined like a cartoon is but you, you definitely see it. So that's why they call it implied line. In crafting, a lot of people call it no line, but it's technically not no line. In, in crafting, it's you stamp with a really light color and then you color over top of it so that line is hidden. And it's the same principle. You want a different value on one side and the other of the line. But in this particular case, I'm just doing stippling on one side or the other so I don't end up with a whole bunch of lines on it. The exception would be some of the veins because the veins really are lines and that starts to communicate that they are leaves. But each one of the shapes, I'm just looking at, I had like six different references for, I, I think I Googled forest floor with fall leaves. And you can Google things like that and come up with lots of references. I was looking for shapes I wasn't looking for like one picture that had the perfect thing to put under my kitten. I was looking for general shapes for leaves. And I would pick out a section in one photograph and start to render some shapes, not trying to worry, worry about whether they were perfect and matching that reference exactly. But I wanted to get the general feel for what a leaf looks like, not, not trying to render everything hyper-realistic because I'm doing it in dots. And I normally, if I were to try to make this into something spectacular, I might take three or four times the amount of time, but I don't have that ton kind of time. So I spent, I think it was a total of four days on this, I think. And they were like eight, 10 hour days. So yeah, quite a bit of time for creating this. The stippling is one of the slowest of the techniques, but it gives you the best ability to blend from 
one area to another. Now the background, I did the whole left side without the camera on because I was like, I think I might be ruining this. And at first when I was working on it, I thought this is not going well. And I just kind of let it alone. And I left it on my desk. And when I walked back in the next day, I looked at it and I went, you know, that does look like a really soft blended forest in the background. So I proceeded and I turned the, the camera on a little bit. And what I'm doing is the tiling or cross hatching. I don't know which you would call it. It's kind of a mix of the two techniques. And as I'm working with light pressure, you see I'm getting a lighter line with the pen. And if I press harder, I get a darker line. There was going to be a big, massive tree in this section, but I wanted to start building up from the lighter stuff on the left over toward the tree on the right. And a lot of this, I worked back and forth so many times. I would build up the section in the background and then realize I wanted it a little bit darker. The one thing about pen and ink is you can't go lighter once you put it down. So I would then have to rework an area to make it darker if I got like one stray pen line that, you know, kind of blooped on me or, you know, my hand just used too much pressure in the middle of something. So then I'd have to create a section around it so that I wouldn't have an isolated big chunk of something. If you're working on a white paper, you can sometimes put a dot of, you know, some like there's this whiteout type of thing that I've used called uh, Presto Jumbo. And you can actually draw on top of that after you put some of that down, but it's basically white out. So you could get some white out and do the same thing for just a dot of something and then go over it and redraw it. But I couldn't do that here on green paper. So when I had an area that I messed up, I had to go back in and darken everything around it. But you can see I'm starting to build up this tree and building the soft edge around it so that it's a, a little softer transition rather than just having the edge of a tree like I would normally draw. But look at the difference between the tail of the cat that I had used really nice solid pressure for all of the pen strokes. And then on the background, I'm just using a very light stroke. So it's just barely glazing across the top of the bumpy surface. Up until now, you've been watching me work twice as fast, two times as fast as normal speed. This is normal speed. And you can see I am moving the pen pretty quickly. If I were to slow it down, and when I'm working on the dark sections, I'll slow it down while I'm trying to make those nice, darker, consistent lines. The difference shows up in the strength of the pen line. If I want it really, really light and really, really faint, then I need to do this quick stroke, but very light pressure. And that makes a huge difference in getting that variance. If you're using a bunch of different pens, so you've got pens that have a very tiny pen width uh, versus one that has a thicker pen width, you might find there's zero difference that you have to do in between your technique. You might be able to do the same speed and the same pressure and be just fine. But if you've got a pen like a fountain pen, you might want to test it get a scrap and find out what kind of pressure is going to give you what kind of line and how hard is it going to be to make a transition from something dark into something light where you get a really soft transition between the shapes. Back to double speed drawing. I wish I could do this all the time. That would be nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can see the development of this column the photographs that I was looking at had various amounts of light coming through in the distance behind the trees. They had very, very light color. And then the trees were not black. They were just a dark color. So you got this really misty kind of feel. It wasn't bokeh, like in the traditional sense where you have those dots, like blurry dots. It's more of just some general mushy shapes of colors, you know, lights to darks to all kinds of things. So you can see here the number of layers that I'm going back and forth with this super light pressure so that I can create some soft transitions in all of those values and then get, get them kind of married up with the tree on the right hand side, which is going to be a little bit darker, and then trying to get them to look like they're creating that soft edge for the tree instead of having a really sharp edge. It's so a sharp edge back here in this distance would take away from the kitten because you'd stop looking at the kitten and you'd be 
drawn to seeing all that stuff in the background. And I really wanted that to be supporting cast. Amazingly, the background took longer than the kitten and the leaves. So there's that. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I wanted to put something down here in the front. And the nice thing about this technique is that you could keep layering and then get rid of it entirely if it didn't work out. So I thought, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'll get rid of it. But I started basically carving into it with cross hatching, you know, just kind of slowly taking out chunks and making darker areas around it. I wanted dark around the kitten. So I'm making sure it gets good and dark around that ear so that it pops. See how I left all that nice white outline around the tail. So it looks like the cat is all lit up. Well, I wanted the same thing around that ear. So I'm going to put lots of dark down that the right hand side of the cat's ear, but I'm going to merge it in somehow with all this mush. And I was kind of playing around with it. I would get sections where I drew too much of a strong, sharp line around some things. It was not looking as fuzzy as everything behind it. So that's when I went and made everything basically a gray tone. And I was going to get grayer than this, but I, my lines got, I was getting tired. So my lines got really thick here. And then I had to go back in and repair some of that. But that helped because what I ended up doing was making that the whole section much darker than I originally was thinking I'd need to go because the more it had sharp details in it, the more my eye was drawn to that. And you can see I'm just like slowly making it darker and darker and darker by cross hatching on top of each of those white areas. And then I wanted to leave just one or two of the, those little white flowers or weeds or whatever they are kind of out in the light and everything else is going to get darker and darker, but not with like black lines around them with dark shapes around them and then carving them out little by little, making them more delicate. And then I just kept going and darkening them more and more so that all of that doesn't fight for attention with the foreground because the foreground is what's important. But I just wanted a little something other than big blocky trees in the background. So this gave me that option. So I decided to sign it, even though I'm still going to do a little work on those trees, but I am super tickled with how the kitten came out. I think he's adorable. Those leaves, I got all that kind of crunchy goodness in the foreground, and then it kind of slowly blends to fuzzier and fuzzier ones in the distance. And the trees in the back, there's a few spots if you squint at them where you can see a darker spot or a lighter spot. I want to smooth some of those out still, but I'm mostly done. I'd love to know what you think in a comment on this video. And if you would like to get the handout, this one comes for free with my completed one and a blank one for you to play with. And then you can also go watch the pen and ink drawing techniques video. If you've missed that one, it is linked in the doobly-doo as well. And there's also classes. If you're looking for something to inspire you during Inktober, I've got a whole bunch of classes. I'll link to one page that has all those on it. And last but not least, if you're looking for some alternate prompts for Inktober, because I don't like all the scary ones that they often put out, we have a whole bunch of them on Art Venture. So you have three or four to choose from each day. If you'd like to join us, it's free to join over there. That's about it for me. I will see you guys again very soon. Take care and go create something every day, especially during Inktober. Get out a pen and do some drawing. I'll see you next time.